I mean, I mean, I suppose really my first sort of question is what made you choose producing? Because I know that you, you're a musician and you, you perform, like, you know, you write music and you sort of perform music, don't you? On spot. Is that a cello in the back? <laughs> yes, it is. Well, most people say guitar. <laughs> and I always go, yes, there's a guitar there. Um, so, I'm, I'm a musician also, so I, I'm, I've sort of uh, got the the eye, <laughs> I suppose. Um, well, you know, I think a lot of people, nobody necessarily knows when they're young what a producer is or yeah. that they want to be a producer. I think that's quite hard. There might be some unique cases where people see theatre and go, I want to put on shows. But I think when you see a nice show, the first thing you think is, I think I want to be in the show or I want to maybe direct the show. I think exactly. creatively in that sense. So for me, I loved musicals and I love theatre, but I also wasn't sure that my calling was to be on stage. Of course, I gravitated towards it when I was younger because mm -hmm you do at school and at um even like we did we did um i was part of an amateur dramatics group out of school and mm -hmm. i could sing so i could act a bit and i love to play all the instruments as well so i had this love of music and musical theater dominated by singing and playing the instruments really yeah um, i did like being on a stage i think i mostly like performing at the piano when i'm singing as well i like yeah. that as a musician so Ultimately, um, if you fast forward or flash forward, whatever the expression is, to, um, I guess, being 18 years old and going to university in London to study human genetics, of all things, <laughs> I, um, I met someone there who wanted to write a musical. Um, we met in the Musical Theatre Society and he was very flamboyant and into opera and he said, let's write a musical. And as soon as I said to him, I had a, p a little keyboard at home. He said, oh, let's let me come round because I live quite <laughs> near the university. So we started writing. He do he sort of wrote m the most of it, but he wasn't necessarily he couldn't read music as well. So together we sort of completed the show. Mm -hmm. And then he went, I want to put it on the stage. I want to put it on the stage. And so <laughs> actually he is to blame when I say this in every interview for me becoming a producer because if he hadn't gone, let's put on a show, I'm not sure I would have, when I would have put a show on. Yeah. And anyway, what, what that gave me was a little taster of finding a venue, making a poster, finding a cast, deciding when the show is, how much would it cost, how much would we charge for tickets. Mm -hmm. We're talking about doing a show for two nights in a church hall that cost about £3,000 to do. Yeah. Um, really, that's the same structure of any production. It's just that that was a much smaller one. And he and I decided to form a proper company, you know, a company's house yeah. and maybe extend our portfolio of shows. And so from the age of 18 to about for about five years, um, when I was also studying, because I left that degree and I eventually went to do a classical music degree. And in the middle of those two degrees, I did a year at a drama school. So all okay. through that kind of weird education, further education, I was running this company with my friend and having a lot of fun doing all of these different things, putting on little shows, building a little, you know, name for ourselves, doing all the administration. I really enjoyed that. I wasn't very commercially ambitious in those days. When I say commercially ambitious, I wasn't, I, I wasn't thinking about Broadway or the West End. I yeah. wasn't thinking about how I would make money. I didn't care. I was young. I was in my early 20s. All I cared about was um, be, having a good time, enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I did. And anyway, in, in a nutshell, I became very interested in it, in producing more and more as I progressed. And I realized that I didn't really want to audition because I had an agent from the previous drama school. Yeah. Really want to continue auditioning. I'd done a few jobs. I'd worked professionally as a musical director. Um, I wanted to take producing more seriously. And two things happened. One, I was assistant musical director on a Christmas musical which I thought was stunning, but not kind of executed well all round. And I wanted yeah. to sort of take it and fix it. Mm -hmm. And I went on a course with a charity, like a workshop um, for commercial producing. And when I listened to the seminar for three days, that's it. That was my light bulb moment of, my God, this is what I'd like to do, you know, yeah. for my career. And that was, in that, I mean, that course 
was in 2012 or 2011. So really the thing that not a lot of people know is Aria is not that, that old. And actually I only started it really as I was approaching my mid to late twenties. And only now am I really at the point of, I would say entering the commercial musical theater market, which is mm -hmm. working on national tours, West End ideas, much bigger budget shows, commissions, um, and getting, you know, getting a bit more of a reputation for that rather than just being an off West End producer, which yeah. is obviously where I've built such a massive portfolio of work over the last six years. Of course, yeah. It's, it's just, it's so, it's really sort of interesting to, to hear that story because because it's in a way you're quite similar to myself um because I, I obviously i i write music i sort of produce with my company direct um perform as well um but it's just sort of it's interesting because like you said you never hear sort of children go oh i want to be a producer um unless they're in the show the producers <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but it's just sort of interesting to know, like, you hear all these stories about how actors became who they are or directors become who they are. But I think producers are the underlying sort of success stories of a, a lot, if not all, successful shows and actors. They're always behind that. Yeah. And I think it's important to discuss that as well. It takes a long time as well. You know, you'll find that most successful producers or people that you know, they are... A I say they're not old, but you don't really hear that the biggest producer in the world is 21 years old. You know, it takes exactly, time yeah. to be able to build. You know, you're not going to necessarily get sent the best show in the world until people think you're somebody. You're not going yeah. to be able to make that happen until you've got respect from the theatre owners, until you be able to raise that significant amount of capital from investors. And all that takes years and years of mm -hmm. building up trust and relationships. You're really right. People do undervalue the role of the producer. Sometimes they think it's just the money person. Yeah. But, you know, careful producing is the reason why a show is successful or not. And they are incredibly important from the title choice of the show to who directs the show to how do you build the rest of the creative team, how mm -hmm. much do you pay the rest of the creative team, are the deals right, where are we going to play it, how long are we going to play it for, how much of the ticket price is going to be. How are we going to market it? When are we going to market it? Yeah. Who's in it? Every single part of the process. It's not just putting in money or providing. Yeah, of course. Food. It's you know, it's 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 a very delicate um, role that has that relationship with every cast member, every part of the creative team. You are the person that makes those decisions, and um, you know, it's you get rewarded when something goes well and. When it doesn't go well, it's devastating for everybody, but mm -hmm. especially for someone that's been producing it behind the scenes for many years before. Yeah, it's it's, it's like you said, like it all it all stems from that that one producer and that producer's company. It also, if if the passion, like you clearly have, of musical theatre and, and theatre in general, if if that's not there, then that can sort of affect what happens. Um, you Absolutely. You've got to think of a producer, really, especially one, I guess, like, like me as, a, as an artistic director. Mm -hmm. We are making artistic decisions about what we produce, who we back and what we develop. We are, um, you know, we are create, as creative as anybody else. It's just that we create the sort of um, main headline thing parts and then we yeah. let other people contribute. You know, once you've chosen the director, you trust that director to go on and you guide them. You choose the right marketing company that you think will respond well to your brand. You expect them to come up with a campaign, but you're there to respond to it. So you're putting more headline terms in place, which is why I think I found exactly the right job for me. Because when I was at school in Manchester, Manchester yeah. High, um, <laughs> I loved school and I loved the diversity of doing many, many things at the same time. Yeah. Do GCSEs was probably my happiest time in education because I like the variety and that um, follows through to my career. You know, I don't just have to focus on one idea for years on end. I can. I mean, of course, if you find a lay Miz, you, you make the most of it. Yeah. <laughs> ultimately, um, it's all about multiple projects, multiple artists, all different stages getting a new script one day, then meeting an investor the next, then going to the rehearsal room, then going to the casting couch and being able to stay on top of all of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's honestly, I mean, 
myself with the company, we sort of, you know, str struggle sometimes with producing. But I mean, looking at your numbers, like like over, I mean, this might have changed, um, but like over 50 shows in like, the past seven years. I mean, it's, it's... I think it's 65, 70. Oh, I mean... <laughs> over the last few years, yeah, but... Um... It's, it's, it's an unbelievable number and it just shows sort of the, the way you stand out as a producer with, with your company because I, pres I presume a lot of them are passion projects, let's say. Um, so I know that shows like um, like Rags um, really stand out to you because obviously um, the Jewish sort of story and obviously working with Stephen Schwartz, I bet that was just, I mean, I, I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> like... It got easier as I stopped being like, you know, in awe and just yeah. like, this guy's a friend, a collaborator, and he was as grateful to be working with us, you know, as much as we mm -hmm. were for him because this was a show he was extremely passionate about that happened so long ago before, uh, when I was born, probably before you were born, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and ultimately it didn't work. And when you're as successful as he is, it's very, very hard to revisit something that was so long ago when one of the writers has passed on, the other mm -hmm. writer isn't actively writing anymore um, because he's elderly. Um, and ultimately, how do you fix that without ripping it apart? So to have a theatre and us working on it um, was really important for him, mm -hmm. you know, for the show. So, you know, I think there has been a lot and there has been, I mean, you know, in a nutshell, we did, I didn't really start earning a living until I did The Adams Family, until 2016, when I really mm -hmm. um, did a big show with a big budget that could have a fee for me. The small shows at the Southwark Playhouse, you know, at the Park Theatre, at yeah. the Hope Theatre, they're, they're they don't generate much at all yeah. um, for a producer. If, I mean, most of them nothing, and actually a lot of debt, a lot of investing our own capital mm -hmm. and investors money to back them because our budgets are very very high on my shows that you know they yeah. are now very very high they get bigger every year because i spend more pay more it just goes up and up and up exactly so, yeah but as you said those shows have now created a portfolio that and as i said before allows me to now go to bigger people who have heard about me because i've done that show or whatever mm -hmm. so it's a long but important marketing exercise yeah learning experience and there's no regrets you know of course uh, yeah it's fulfilling it, it's all like i mean especially like at the start of the career it's all like a learning curve it's all developing that because like obviously so we said like you've been working with stevie schwartz and you've got the the rags album um which is phenomenal like it's such a phenomenal achievement and obviously that wouldn't have been possible earlier on in your career but you sort of work up to these big Thanks. events like you said like um the adams family in 2016 that was sort of quite a big turning point and That's a phenomenal it. show by the way <laughs> everything happens for a reason yeah you know everything so i think success breeds success and it might look like i had a big plan to get where i am today but actually yeah it wasn't necessarily planned as well as people think. I mean, there were stepping stones, like I knew I wanted to be a commercial producer, but I knew I didn't just want to raise loads of money and experiment. I knew I wanted to build slowly mm -hmm. in my own way. And when the opportunity came, I would go into the bigger world. And when I thought in 2015, so sort of like four years into Ari, I thought, I think I can start raising bigger money now. I think I can start. Yeah. I've met a few people that want to back me and I've got this relationship with this person. I thought I need a title that I could tour. Now, I'm also very choosy. I think I've got a name because I've done quite rare musicals. You yeah. know, from Mr. Edwin Drew to Tommy to Pippin to Yang to, to whatever. You know, they're not the obvious choices. Yeah, um, a lot of them revivals as well. Yeah, and a lot of new musicals mm -hmm. as well with my From Page to Stage series. So I got a reputation for being quite... I guess brave and it, but I didn't want to just take a big title on tour. I wanted to mm -hmm. find something fresh and that's when I went after Adams and that was bold and crazy and a brave because it could have just not happened. 
It's quite mm. rare to get hold of a Broadway title like that's got profile for England that isn't the American replica. So for example, yeah. Wicked, Hamilton, On Your Feet, Avenue Q originally, Dear Evan Hansen, Waitress, they're all replica productions. They are all yeah. the same show from Broadway with the same director, with the same um, producer, maybe with a British partner, but ultimately no creative control. And Adam Somney obviously had a bit of a checkered past on Broadway and wasn't yeah. a strong hit. And so they didn't want to do it in the West End. They were done with the show, I think, or they also felt it would be a risk. And that meant that we could get a hold of such an amazing title mm -hmm. for a non-replica British premiere. And that taught me so much on the road about making money, about marketing, box office, that scale. And I found it exciting. I uh, had a great producing partner who I learned from, who had done a lot of touring. So I was able to build the most amazing stage management team, great venues, because all of that's part of it. Having the yeah. right venues, having the right deals, having the right running costs. Every single part of the equation needs to be thought through. It just shows like how, I mean, how, how important, which sounds stupid to say, but how important a producer really really is and like we said before sort of maybe a bit underestimated within the, within the industry and like you said people just think it's about just pumping money into it but like you said as a creative as well with, with your sort of musical and creative background it's so much more um yeah i'm just curious about this one so obviously a lot of your work maybe has been passion projects and shows you've been wanting to revive and um, like you said, shows that sort of have been dormant for a little bit and you've brought back. Are there any shows now that you sort of want to grab and, and make your own and revive in a way? Of course. Like, there's, is that, sorry, is that the end of the question? It yes, yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, God, yes, of course. There are more revivals I want to do, but mm -hmm. the list getting smaller because obviously there's only so many shows that ex existed since 1920 you know and some of them I'm not going to do ever um some of them are never going to be done probably by anyone yeah and, and some I've already done future is on cultivating the next dear Evan Hansen the next six the next come from away the next rent whatever I want to find yeah. new work and I want Britain to start being at the forefront of making new work. But of course, mm -hmm. that's incredibly risky and incredibly hard. Yeah. But I've now <laughs> put together quite a big strategy and network to be able to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping over the next few years, you'll see lots of RE Entertainment premieres of new shows. That's very exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Because I mean, all your shows have had you know, amazing responses. Um, I'd like to just touch on um, what you mentioned before, actually, your uh, Page to Stage um, Festival event series. Um, you sort of, you know, you promote, you put on and develop uh, new musicals and you sort of give new musicians, new composers sort of the platform to do that, which I think is such a phenomenal thing. And something that until I'd heard about it a couple of years ago, I'd never seen or heard a company do that before. Um, and it's just an amazing thing. And obviously in 2000, and I think it was 2017, um, it was done at the other palace, which is, of course, Angela Webber's um, place. Um, how how did, did that come about? Obviously, meeting him, working with him and, you know, using, using his uh, theatre. So when... They announced that they he was going to buy that theatre and he wanted mm -hmm. to do new musicals there. I had, and again, this is about being a producer and building contacts and building yeah. relationships. I had a contact with his, you know, his top um, top staff member, yeah, um, who's like the president of the really useful group. And my first action was to contact her and to tell her that I was doing this festival and that mm -hmm. I felt that my vision aligned with his vision and would the really useful group maybe want to be a partner on the next year's festival. So 
you know, she went, oh, you must meet Andrew. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's so scary and exciting. Uh, anyway, I did meet him uh, for an hour where mm -hmm. I talked him through all of my brochures of the festival. Yeah. And he said to her, yes, let's have Katie do this for three weeks in the, in the theatre. Um, before that, I'd obviously run the festival since 2013. Mm -hmm. Very similar premise, you know, opening up a submission process for say a year, you know, for say three months, selecting the work over another three months and selecting work at four different stages. So songs from writers, new songs when mm -hmm. the show they haven't written, readings of shows that were like second draft, showcases for shows that were sort of semi-completed, but done with sort of one cast, and then they were in sort of all four yeah. of the showcases, and then fully staged musicals in a workshop style. So full shows with production values off book, but mm -hmm. not sort of fully produced. Um, and that also, did, that was exactly what we did at the other palace. And then this year and last year, we haven't done the festival because mm -hmm. my producing career, I was doing bigger projects and yeah. I needed, and I started to think that the festival was really more for me and the, the writers. It wasn't, get, it was very difficult to engage with venues. People don't want to come in and see three weeks of material. So I decided that I would spend the same time on it having another staff member join me that would help me assess work full-time throughout okay. the year. Yeah. Now we are the only, I think, full-time literary department. And what I mean by that is people can send us their show at any time, not just over, say, three months of the year. It's kind of yeah. over all the time for people to send us their work. We, we, we receive, you know, well, during this crisis, we maybe have had another 100 shows sent wow. in the last eight weeks. <laughs> yeah. It it's just shows like... I mean, that statistic alone, another 100 shows in the past eight weeks, just shows how creative the, the UK can be in... in well, that's international, Croatia. actually. Oh, international. Into the, into the world, yeah. Um, so, yeah, well, it's just people, not everybody's heard of us, so we've been promoting us as well, we've been promoting mm -hmm. the brand, so people are sending shows that they've got that have never been produced, because that's the only criteria, really. It can never have been produced before. Yeah. Yeah, just it, it, it's a it's a phenomenal concept, and obviously it's 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 working fantastically. And you know, I've sort of worked on sort of original musicals before, but not really thought about that that next step for it. I mean, it's it's for loads of composers and uh, sort of directors or writers of musicals, the achievement is is writing it, and then they sort of some forget about it. But with obviously you guys promoting new musicals, it gives them an opportunity to to push it, to, to get it produced, to to get it to their dream sort of state. And it's 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 just that it's a new and fresh way of getting new musicals um, yeah. in, in into the into the world, into the UK, into Europe. It's fantastic. Totally. Um, carry on building the brand, building the audience, building the reputation. Of course, yeah. Um, so we've touched, we've touched on, um, Stephen Schwartz. I would just like to talk about the, um, the sort of, the, the way you've sort of touched on his shows. Cause obviously there's, you've worked up with, uh, on Pippin and Rags and Children of Eden. That was a, um, West End charity gala. Um, and obviously we've got the Rags album. Um, have you always been a fan of Stephen Schwartz? Have we just sort of, stumbled somehow on working on a lot of his um his shows well children of eden i mean I, I love musicals and so i think i probably discovered children of eden first um mm -hmm. when i was probably at, at when i was at london school of musical theatre when i was 18 um and then we did this charity concert when aria was born and then pippin i wasn't that familiar with but I listened to it and thought, wow, gosh, yeah. that's incredible. Um, Rags was, I mean, obviously Rags, he didn't write the music, he wrote the lyrics, yeah. so slightly different. But, um, you know, it, 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 that is just coincidence, you know. Rags was some, in fact, the same boy that I set the theatre company up with, he was the one that bought me a, 
CD of rags from a charity shop he found, um, <laughs> starring Judy Kuhn, who we love, and she's the voice of Pocahontas. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And he said, oh my God, there's a show that's like the sequel to Fiddler on the Roof. We're going to love it. We're going to love it. Because <laughs> he was also Jewish. And then I researched the history of the show. I never thought, oh my God, years later, I will produce the final version of the show. Like, yeah. It's going to be published as the new new rights. Like that's a that's just an unheard of, right? But you know, um, I don't know. I wrote to when Stephen came over for Pippin. We went for lunch, and I said to him, "I'm sorry, he didn't come over for Pippin. He was over." And we said, "Do you want to come to Pippin?" Yeah, and he, yeah. And then he, um, I said, "I'm I love rags. I'm that girl who wanted to do rags. I mean, because I did a concert of it in 2014 as well. Yeah, I've done it three times." <laughs> um, I said I'm the girl who's obsessed with rags and he wouldn't let me put it on and he was like well what a time to ask he said I'm, I'm, we've now revised it and we'd be really interested in a production of it in England and that's how that started it's just a phenomenal story it, it's, it's, it all works it, out doesn't yeah it? it's, it's fa- honestly fantastic and I mean the fact that you can say you've, you've worked with like Lloyd Webber and Schwartz and all these like, phenomenal people it's you, 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 when you when you start out you don't think of these things like you said like it's it's weird to think that the new revised sort of new version of rags is it's yours it's with your name it, it's you don't think of these things but when they happen it's it's just such a turning point and such a, an achieve it's like an achievement you weren't expecting it sort of makes it, right. makes it better when i mean i'm just looking at some of our, these posters like when we did the hair production that's is what the marketing yeah. company gave and when i think when we get the rag cd i probably will put it in a frame mm-hmm. right it's an it is a great achievement and it's an honor really but and it's even more so with that show because it's personal to of me of course yeah um yeah you have to pinch yourself but you also it just becomes your life yeah you know these sorts of people um and you realize that that's what happens. The more you work, the more chance you're going to meet these legends because in musical theatre, it's a very small um, group of us. Yeah. <laughs> small industry. You know, I go to New York and I know most of the people. Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting business. And you've it got is. to be nice to everybody on the way up because you never know what might happen. Precisely, precisely. <laughs> but like you said, it is such an amazing business and... I'm just wondering, like, over the past couple of years, a lot of, like we said before, a lot of uh, Broadway shows especially have um, come over. Um, it's, such a question, it's such a question that I can't even answer it, but do you have a particular sort of favourite show or sort of more preferred show that's uh, come to the West End in the past couple of years? For me, it's more the diversity. I, I, I like... I, Musical theatre complements each other. So, mm-hmm. you know, I love to see Come From Away one day and then Dear Evan Hansen the next day. And obviously, I, a lot of the shows I've produced, I love. And they couldn't be more different. Some of them are yeah. so different. I love The Secret Garden's beautiful romantic score. Mm-hmm. I love Hair score. I love the legit nature of Rag score. <laughs> I've done Tick, Tick, Boom. I love Pippin. I love Sondheim. I love Jerry Herman. You know, it, for it's, me... It's literally it, just so many. <laughs> one thing you know yeah all is amazing one minute you're listening to sending the clowns you're like oh sometime and then actually you just listen to something simple like all i ask of you by andrew and you're like oh my gosh what a tune um but you know <laughs> i don't know it's um there's it's going to change a lot it's very only 100 years old and mm-hmm. music theater is not just the songs anymore it's everything you know so yeah, it's, there's not one particular show or one particular style. Yeah. It's everything. It's, it's how different shows can be and it's, how brilliant that is. And it's such like a, that, I mean, that answer is probably the same when you'd ask like different people, like, because I, I couldn't name like, you know, my, my favorite show. Or it's like when people say, like, name your favorite show, you go, oh, you've got this and then this, or like your favorite composer. And yeah. Because th- there's, like you said, it's such a, a small pool industry-wise, but the quality in that small pool is unbelievable. Um, 
so I'm just this is this is again just sort of a an open sort of question, but um, regarding what's happening now with theatre in the UK, especially, um, what what do you think is next? Which I know is a difficult question, but what do you think is coming next for theatre? Um, obviously, regarding the terrible thing that's happened, um, the pandemic. What, what do you think? I mean, next? if you asked me last week, I would give you a different answer to this week because mm -hmm. there's been a lot of, you know, there's what I feel and there's what I read. I mean, I, I was hoping last week that by the end of the year we might be open by the mm -hmm. autumn, but the more I read, the more I'm being told that's not going to happen and it's going to be next spring onwards, even summer. Yeah. So right now, I'm literally not planning nothing before um, the second half of next year. Um, mm -hmm. And trying to think about what, you know, if, if that's not a thing, when can I start a show before then? And also um, how I can generate and restructure the business to make money and opportunities if it's not in theatre, which is very difficult. But it's... so I don't know. I believe theatre will definitely bounce back. I believe theatre will thrive again. I believe that um, we have loyal audiences. We have great talent. <laughs> But I just think we've got a bit of a way to go before we can fire up those machines again. Yeah. It's... And I, I don't know when that is. I'm still waiting to hear from people more experienced than me, the government, whatever. Mm -hmm. All I can do is sit and hope and hope that the virus disappears, giving people confidence to start things up again. Um, yeah, but all I can think about is my business model. And of course, yeah. And I commit to the shows and when I can commit to tours and I've already had to restructure three tours which I start obviously did started to do eight weeks ago but none of them yeah. are presented yet because they're always moving because everything's mm -hmm. moving so it's very very hard I've been building to next year's you know work um for so long and to think that it's all been compromised it's very hard it is very difficult I mean it's it's such a like you said um, like if I asked you that question last week, you give a different answer. It's it's constantly changing, and you know it's it's so devastating to hear about you know some theatres closing down and yeah and some some shows. I mean, obviously this is broader, but like Frozen um, is sort of been taken off Broadway. Um, it didn't have its its chance to sort of finish its its stint on Broadway properly, but it is it's in a different position. Yeah. I think. I think I don't know for fact. Um, I don't know if, if this is true, but I think in America, some of the theatres are trying to charge, start charging the rent again to the producer, which is not going to happen. So if the producer mm -hmm. closes the show, they don't have to do that. Um, in the UK, I don't think the the theatres are charging the producers um, different rules, different places. But if a show is already past its slot, how, where does it go yeah. then? Um, yeah. Just really, really um unpredictable but at the same time smaller theatres I mean you know all theatres cost a lot of money to operate but I think it's harder for the bigger theatres because their costs are so huge they need such huge bailouts but the independent producer has no way of making any income full stop and can't yeah, get yeah. Any of grants nothing to to start you know to cover them for the year They've got no income and the staff they've got. So yeah. if, there's no, if, there's, if the independent producer's got no income, there's going to be no product for the theatres. Precisely. It's all, all a problem. Mm -hmm. Big problem. So um, affecting yeah, all, it's, all factors, really, sort of everyone we involved. We are the worst industry hit because we cannot just fire up with a day's notice. And yeah. We have astronomical costs to start a business um, up again. You know, exactly. no one business spends millions just to build a product to see if it can run. Most businesses go, they buy the product for what they can sell, you know? Yeah. So it's really, really bad. It's, it, it has left, like you said, the theatre industry in, in not, a, not a good state. Um, but we will bounce back. We always do. We are the British yeah. people. <laughs> um, and... I suppose to to sort of close this in a way on sort of a 
a brighter note, let's say, um, what advice or sort of what words of wisdom, obviously from your amazing, amazing career you've had so far, and it will be even more amazing in the years to come, um, what sort of words of wisdom or advice would you maybe give someone who's looking to go into producing or even just to have their own company or to sort of yeah. wind away into the theatre in some way? What, what would you say to them? Well, you've got to decide what it is you want to say and what it is you want to produce. You have to feel passionate about a product or several products. That's the first thing. I don't think you should make a decision to be a producer if you don't already have some ideas or you're not yeah. someone full of ideas because you're generating projects and then you're trying to make a living out of that project. So you've got to be able to do that. You've got to be willing to put the time in and realize that it might be a long time before you might even generate an income. So you have to think about the way you're going to survive, how you're bringing in an income at the same time how you, when you're building up a smaller company and doing smaller shows that cover their costs but don't really make anything. Yeah. Um, and you've got to be prepared for that graft and prepared for that hard work and prepared for a lot of rejection from theatres, investors, acting talent, literary agents. It's going to be really tough. Um, you've got to be a bit of a sponge, be ready to learn, to read, to meet people that are more experienced, to knock on doors and ask for help and research which theatres you want to work at and why. Um, constantly learn. Like I, When I was younger, I would always send like new emails every day. Every day I would send five new emails to five people and hope yeah. that someone would reply and I'd meet someone new. I was always reaching out. I was always going to New York like spending a fortune just to go there on the plane and yeah. hotels just so I could introduce myself to people at different theatres. I mean, I would, I thought I was a somebody and would knock on the door of a big theatre and go, hello. <laughs> now I go, wow, I did that five years ago and I didn't really have any experience. And, you know, but I did it. Yeah. And now people are still in my life watching me, you know, grow. And then hopefully in another five years, there'll be another few credits to my name that put me on another level with them. So you've just got to understand it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, yeah. It's a whole career. It's not a job. It's your life. And there's no rush. It took me a long time and a lot of investment to even get where I am now, which is the beginning of my commercial career, really. Um, and yeah, sorry, that's quite a bit of advice, but I hope it's all you I know it is. It's, it all means so much. And, if for anyone who's been watching this, they're going to take different things from that. I mean, I myself am going to be taking things from that. <laughs> it's, it's, um, but it's, it, it's, it's so incredible to, to hear sort of your, your perspective on things and, and the way you've sort of worked your way up. And obviously you've probably got loads and loads of plans ahead, like with, um, revivals or show. I mean, there was, um, auditions that were going around for the Adams family. Is that correct? Yes, yes, for Lucas, which yes. we did on Zoom. And obviously, we're now waiting to see when theatres are going to open, because our tour was meant to start in August. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, there's watch out for the news, because we have, I don't know, maybe, I know this sounds crazy, but roughly 10 projects at the moment that we're working <laughs> on. At the yeah. same time? Yeah. Oh, theory me. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Yeah, this well, festival's driving me up the wall. <laughs> That's just one again, thing. It's about working quickly and making decisions quickly and being able to communicate quickly. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, not everyone has to do that much. That's just the way I yeah. like. You know. Yeah, like you said, it's it's your sort of perspective, and you know that you can work well on multiple things at once, and sort of not let one thing sort of dip. Like you, all your focus goes on them things, and it's you know how different people work, I suppose, and you know your way of working is clearly um a success and it's such an achievement and i mean i've got like pages and up on pages of research and it's just oh like unbelievable the, the, the things you've been doing and where you've you know like you said at the start of this interview the way you started and where you are now um and i'm sure it's just going to get bigger and better and more crazy oh. <laughs> That's very um, <laughs> just out of curiosity, um, how many instruments do you play? Well, three instruments. 
and singing but piano is my sort of main although my piano is not here it's with the Zorro production um, oh, wow. and it's uh, and then cello I learned at school because I wanted to be in an orchestra and then I played like basic guitar as well that's one thing I've missed as I've got more busy not having time for the instruments and that's something I wish my piano was here because I'd be playing it and it's yeah. not so that's a shame usually it's... there <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I'm going to try and find more time for that. That's my reflection. Yeah, it's. It, it, I mean, for me personally, it's been it's been a fantastic time to just sort of sit on a piano and just either write or just mess around. Or, but I'll I'll very often play through whole scores, just yeah, just to sort of let out some emotion or you know anxiety or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, it takes a while <laughs> to go through whole shows, but it's it, it's the joy that musical theatre brings. And also, I've, I've never actually, this sounds totally bizarre, but I've never spoke to anyone who plays the cello. It's very interesting. It's very, I've always wanted to play the harp. Because I play, my main instrument is the piano, and I play a bit of sort of rhythm guitar. Um, but I've always wanted to play the harp. But that's quite an investment. Um, <laughs> well, do it. You only live once. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe I'll um, ask ask uh, Santa for it for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> do it. Do it. Oh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we'll we'll we'll, we'll call that there. It's been amazing uh, speaking to you. Oh, thank you. And. Um, obviously i wish you the most amazing success um and i hope you and your company and the whole theater industry sort of get back to their feet sooner rather than later because us theater goers and us theater makers we we miss it we really do yeah. i mean yeah. it's it's been sort of nice every friday for the past couple of weeks watching the um the show must go on the angelo webber musicals that have yeah. been on youtube um that sort of kept me going. It's like, oh, yeah. I can't wait till Friday. <laughs> For sure. Oh, um, but, but keep doing, you're doing exactly the right thing, staying motivated, doing things that empower you because it's really hard on, the men, on your men, on mental health and actually giving back is very rewarding. So you're exactly. doing great things for other people and that's great and that's, that's all that matters and that's exactly how I started building ARI. I just did lots of great work for people and audiences and all, all that mattered was the work and the now you know mm -hmm. not worrying about the future just worrying about the now and you know what I mean yeah exactly I mean we're sort of running with the the hashtag uh, keep creatives creating because that's yeah. what, is, what what these these two events that we've been doing over lockdown that's sort of what we've been trying to promote like you know it's keeping us as a company creative but also we're getting like hundreds of writers, actors, um, professionals like yourself, sort of yeah. just promoting it and, and helping us creatives get through it because it can be, it is a difficult time for us all and it's just keeping that extra bit of positivity yeah. and that creativity going. 